Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our new Echo Series Listening to Long COVID, brought to you by Health Confianza, a collaboration between the UT Health San Antonio and the San Antonio Metropolitan Health District. Please note that we are recording this session so we can share later. Your names do not appear in the recording notes, anything listed in the chat. My name is Raquel Romero. I am so glad to see you. I hope you and your family are doing well. I'm a physician by training and I'm gonna be the facilitator for the ECHO session today. Before we get started, I have some notes from the ECHO IT. Please stay muted only as you are speaking. These sessions are allowed for closed captioning. You can access that function navigating in the bottom of your Zoom window and select show caption option in the more menu. If you like assistance on your connection, you can always send a private message to the ECHO IT. We promote interactions in our sessions and I invite you and encourage you to participate in our session today. You can also add your comments in the chat through the session today. Um, to help us with our attendance, I would like to ask if you please enter your name, credentials, affiliation, and emails in the chat. And please remember that no personal health information is allowed with the discussing cases and scenarios. We are so excited to know that these series provide free continuing education credits for physicians, physician assistants, nurses, pharmacists, pharmacist technicians, social workers, community health workers, certificate of participation, which accounts as a no accredited CEs. Towards the end of the session, you want to receive information in the chat. Please click on the link, complete the survey, and your certificate is automatically uh, generated. And then uh, you have access only to Tuesday, 5 p.m. For those that are new for the ECHO, uh, ECHO uh, stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. This is a lifelong learning and telementorship that connects healthcare workers and providers to provide a community of practice and learning. It's a very special space that we can share resources and strategies to support our community. And this series, Listening to Long COVID, explore the effects of the long COVID and share managing strategies, including complementary approaches to deliver care. At this session, we want to have educational presentation, and then we want to hear and we want to see a video, a testimony from someone that has been impacted for long COVID. Um, and then we want to have a discussion. I hope to see you in the next session. It's a total of six. Um, I would like to take a moment to say thanks to the Confianza team and, and do the introduction for our ECHO team. And I would like to start with Dr. Bergen. Dr. Bergen, would you please introduce yourself? Hi, Ruth Bergen. I'm an infectious disease specialist and a member of the Health Confianza team. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosenfeld. Hi, afternoon, everyone. Jason Rosenfeld, Assistant Professor, Implementing Director for the Health Confianza Project. Good to see you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Barnes. Hi, I'm Dr. Barnes uh, from the University of the Incarnate Word and faculty in the Pike School of Pharmacy. Thank you very much. Joaquin Abrego Muerte. What's up, y'all? I'm Joaquin Muerte. I also go by Joaquin Abrego. I am a community health worker, social justice activist, musician, podcaster. I do all kinds of stuff. I'm a creative. Uh, but I also uh, do health club with Health Confianza as a community outreach coordinator. Uh, holla at me. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also thank you for the ECHO team for the coordination of these sessions. Finally, I would like to mention that ECHO is all teach on an environment. So I invite you and encourage you to participate in our session today in our conversation by sharing your experience, questions, and perspectives. As a part of our agenda, we have next didactics, and then we want to have the video for someone that has been impacted by the COVID. Today is the, the the presentation is from Dr. Patterson on integrative health approaches to long COVID management. Um, Dr. Patterson has a scheduled conflicts, but kindly record the presentation today. And she may be able to join us later, but I would like to ask Carly, if you please share the presentation. So I record it. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Jan Patterson, Professor of Medicine Infectious Diseases at the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio, and I'm also Medical Director of the Integrative Medicine Program at University Health. Today I'm going to talk to you about integrative strategies for long COVID. 
These are my disclosures. Uh, the ones relevant for today would be that I've received income from Essential Oil Company, and I'm a co-investigator for the Recover NIH trial, which is a trial to look at long COVID. Our learning objectives for today are to define the nomenclature and major features of long COVID that require management, also to define integrative medicine to learn what that is, and to list some integrative medicine strategies for the management of long COVID. So uh, just so we're on the same page about nomenclature, you'll hear several terms, post-acute sequelae of long COVID or PASC, long call, long haul COVID, post COVID-19 condition, chronic COVID, and there is now an ICD-10 code, which should be used when seeing patients with this uh, so that we can learn more and, and about this disease and also track the number and magnitude of patients and conditions. Now, there's actually two definitions, the World Health Organization definition, which talks about uh, continuation or development of new sy symptoms three months after COVID infection with these symptoms lasting for at least two months. And then the CDC definition, which talks about uh, signs and symptoms that develop after infection, and they're present for four weeks or more after the initial phase. So uh, there's there's a bit of time frame difference, but basically, if uh, the the symptoms are are new after or during COVID and, and last for uh, four weeks or more, then that is long COVID. So. Here, we'll just look at some of the key features. There are more features than this, but these are, these are some of the key features and their proposed pathology, their proposed etiologies, although there's still work being done on this to define the, the, the pathology and causes better. But fatigue, post-exertional malaise, that is being very tired after exertion, uh, brain fog, these are thought to be perhaps metabolic and related to mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, dizziness, postural tachycardia syndrome or POTS disease, which is uh, being dizzy and, ta and tachycardic on standing. Uh, as uh, are, These are thought to be uh, due to an abnormal autonomic system or inflammation of the endothelium or the lining of the blood vessels. Uh, gastrointestinal shortness of breath and skin uh, manifestations may be due to mast cell dysfunction and anxiety depression uh, related to mental and emotional uh, etiologies. Now, again, these are, not, uh, these are not defined for sure as etiologies, but these are thought to be related pathologies uh, with these key features. So let's talk a little bit about integrative medicine. What is it? It's an approach to the whole patient, body, mind, and spirit. So in conventional medicine, we often just um, you know, look at the body or the mind. We give, you know, we give a pill or we do a procedure. But in integrative medicine, we integrate evidence-based holistic therapies with conventional medicine, and we use natural and non-invasive therapies or minimally invasive therapies when possible. Integrative medicine is not complementary medicine because complementary medicine is usually done in parallel not integrated with conventional medicine. And it's not alternative medicine because alternative medicine, you're practicing these therapies instead of conventional medicine. So the difference with integrative medicine is that we integrate the holistic therapies with conventional therapies. So I'm going to talk about first some randomized controlled trials that have been done. Many of these have been done in other countries, but the uh, the entities that have been studied are available in the United States and can be used in the United States. Um, and I'm not going to talk about brand names or proprietary names uh, because this is a CME presentation. And so if you're interested in the particular brand names, uh, that would be uh, something to look further at uh, in the publication um, references that I give you. But you can also uh, look these up just based on uh, the names that are given in, in the slides that I'm giving you as well. So this is a study of adaptogens. Now, in the integrative medicine world, adaptogens are considered compounds that help you become more resistant to stress, fatigue, insomnia, and uh, increase your immunity. So in other words, they, they improve the body's uh, response to stress. 
And this was a randomized placebo controlled trial uh, of about 100 people. And they looked at a proprietary blend of adaptogens. And these were rhodiola, eleutherococcus, and schisandra. And this supplementation was given for two weeks. And they, in their follow up, they found that there was an improvement in daily walk time cough, decreased creatinine, and decreased IL-6 or interleukin-6, which is an inflammatory compound, compared to placebo. And this is one using aromatherapy. In this particular trial, it was a small trial, but it was a randomized controlled, placebo-controlled trial using a proprietary blend of thyme, orange, clove bud, and frankincense, inhaled daily, twice daily for two weeks, and their follow-up showed that there were lower fatigue scores and also increased vigor and decreased mental fatigue compared to placebo and those that used the essential oil blend. Now, uh, for me, this is certainly uh, feasible uh, and because I've, I use essential oils myself and essential oils go through the olfactory, the smell nerve, directly to the limbic system in the brain, the, the most primitive part of the brain that controls our, emo our emotions and our motivations. So uh, this seems totally plausible to me that uh, this could be helpful. Let's look at food supplements now. And this study was done uh, in another country, but these supplements are available in the U.S., and this was another randomized placebo-controlled trial of about 188 people. They used fermented papaya and a fruit called Mirinda citrifolia, or noni, N-O-N-I is another name for it, and this was a proprietary blend of these uh, two supplements, uh, fermented and with honey in the, in the preparation. These plants, the, the fermented papaya and the noni, are known for being immunomodulating and anti-inflammatory. And 28 grams of this supplement was used twice daily for, 28, for 20 days. And they found that there was decreased clinical symptoms, a decrease in inflammatory compounds, IL-6 and IL-8, and less nitric oxide, oxide metabolites compared to placebo. This is a study of another supplement called oxaloacetate. Um, and the, the form of this that was studied is, is anhydrous enol oxaloacetate, or AEO, as it's abbreviated. This oxaloacetate is essential for gluconeogenesis in the Krebs cycle, and it's been used previously for uh, energy and mental focus. So um, this was a non-randomized controlled trial, about 43 people. Um, 16 uh, dropped out of the trial. So it was a small trial. And uh, you can see here how they dosed people variably uh, twice a day or three times a day for six weeks, and then a decreased dosage for the next six weeks. But they did find a decrease in fatigue that was dose dependent. That is, those who had been on the higher doses were more likely to uh, manifest the decreased fatigue. Now, there are also natural sources of this oxaloacetate uh, besides this uh, proprietary uh, supplement. So some natural food sources of this are the daikon radish, sacred lotus, cucurbita or gourd, and tarragon. So this study looked at supplements and olfactory or smell training, and it was another randomized placebo-controlled trial of 69 people done, uh, again, in another country. This one was done in Rome. And this was looking at a form of palmito oil, eth ethanolamide, and luteolin, or P-E-A-L-U-T, which is anti-neuroinflammatory, and also olfactory training using lemon, eucalyptus rose, and clove oil. So uh, in this study, using the supplement and the olfactory training, uh, there was improved memory and olfaction compared to placebo. So uh, you can think about using the supplement uh, as directed in this study, in uh, the, the doses in this study, we, um, uh, because these supplements are available in the US, although not in the combined form as it was in this study. But natural sources of PEA are egg yolks and peanuts, and natural sources of luteolin are celery, parsley, broccoli, carrots, peppers, cabbage, and apple skin. So, um, you know, fruits and vegetables, uh, peanuts, egg yolks are healthy things to eat uh, as far as looking for these particular uh, supplements. Now, 
There have also been some supplement stacks, that is a group of supplements that people have used. Um, and there's less evidence for these. These were not randomized controlled trials or even controlled trials, but they're, these are anecdotal experiences with those who have taken a, uh, a combination of supplements such as high dose vitamin C and D, niacin, quercetin, zinc, selenium, with or without magnesium. And there's an experience that was written up in the British Journal of General Practice uh, about this supplement stack. And then this long COVID handbook, uh, which is uh, largely anecdotal data. Uh, one of the authors did a survey. It was uh, not really a randomized survey, not formally done, but uh, people who participated in the survey showed modest improvements from taking niacin and also from using low histamine diets. Remember that mast cell release may be related to some of the pathologies like uh, the GI and uh, lung and uh, shortness of breath uh, and skin manifestations. So, um, so these are, uh, you know, considered in some situations. Well, what about probiotics? Probiotics are getting used for almost everything these days. And uh, there is a theoretical uh, uh, support for probiotics for COVID-19 therapy and long-term complications. And the rationale for this is that the gut microbiota uh, are definitely linked to long-term manifestations of uh, this and other diseases. Also, there is some evidence that probiotics may fight viral infections, and so it may be an adjuvant therapy. This was not uh, a formal study of probiotics in COVID-19, but just an exploration of the theoretical support for probiotics. I will say one thing about probiotics here. Um, in that if you are eating a, a healthy plant-based diet of fruits and vegetables, uh, that you will have a lot of prebiotics, which support the natural uh, bacteria in the gut uh, that are the same type of uh, uh, organisms that are found in the probiotics over the counter. So, and the probiotics can be rather expensive. So, you know, just uh, using a healthy diet in general. And then if you want to use uh, natural probiotics, those are found in fermented foods like yogurt that has uh, natural cultures, uh, as well as sauerkraut and kimchi and kombucha or some others that have natural probiotics. Okay, so what about low-dose naltrexone? This gets talked about a lot. And uh, you might say, well, this is not really integrative medicine because it's a pharmaceutical. And that's true, but uh, the low-dose form of it um, has been popular for uh, an integrative approach for a number of conditions. And uh, the low dose form, it has to be uh, compounded at a compounding pharmacy because that low dose is not found in uh, the commercial preparations that are available. It's typically found in 25 or 50 milligram uh, capsules. Um, and so, um, so this has to, this, these, uh, this low do dose naltrexone has to be formulated in a compounding pharmacy. This was an observational study, no controls, about 50 patients. They took low dose naltrexone, one milligram uh, daily during month one, two milligrams daily during month two, and they showed improvement in six of seven parameters. Uh, that is in their COVID-19 recovery, uh, improvement in limitations of activities of daily living, energy levels, pain levels, concentration, sleep disturbance, and improvement in mood, although that one was not significant. So um, low-dose naltrexone, because it is very low-dose and they're thereby uh, very well-tolerated and few side effects, um, can be considered as a, as a potential um, therapy or at least supplemental therapy. Okay, so let's look at some other, um, you know, non-pharmaceutical uh, uh, alternatives. And here's one, in inspiratory muscle training. This is basically pulmonary rehab. This was a randomized controlled trial of almost 300 people um, in the UK and Denmark where they did inspiratory muscle training for eight weeks. And they showed improvement in breathlessness and chest symptoms, improved respiratory muscle strength and aerobic fitness compared to placebo. So this is a particular interest in people who have the persistent shortness of breath and persistent respiratory symptoms. Now, uh, diaphragm release plus the inspiratory muscle training was also looked at, and this was a randomized controlled trial of about 50 men in the Middle East 
looking at diaphragm release plus inspiratory training versus inspiratory training alone. And uh, with the diaphragm release, there was improvement in breathlessness and chest symptoms, strength and aerobic fitness compared to placebo. So adding the diaphragm release to the inspiratory muscle training can be uh, a, an additional help um, in this kind of manual therapy. So you might say, well, what is manual diaphragm release or what is diaphragm release? Uh, this is a, um, a picture of how it's done. It's basically putting the fingers under the rib cage and uh, with each breath, um, putting the fingers further under there and then finally uh, pulling pulling the fingers down to kind of stretch out the diaphragm. You know, many times we are just breathing with our chest and not fully breathing with our diaphragm. And particularly if we've had an illness, uh, we have, you know, more shallow, rapid breathing rather than deep, slow, uh, diaphragmatic breathing. So this can help with stretching out the diaphragm. So um, there's actually a helpful YouTube video on this, how to release your own diaphragm. Uh, and I gave the link here and basically on YouTube, you can just search manual diaphragm release and you'll come up uh, with uh, some of these videos that show you how to do it uh, in a video format so you can do it on yourself. Okay, now here's an, an interesting program. This is called the ENO or English National Opera Breathe Program. This was a randomized controlled trial of 150 people in the UK. And it basically was an online breathing and well-being program focused on breathing retraining using singing techniques, hence coming from the English National Opera. They received a welcome pack, which I'll show you in a minute. They got weekly online lessons. There was a focus group and emails uh, for encouragement and follow-up, uh, online resources that were self-directed, uh, and they used actually singing of lullabies and exercise videos uh, to practice the techniques. And so the outcome was a um, improved mental health and less breathlessness. Uh, they found that using these complementary therapies integrated with standard care was helpful. And they found particularly that the suitability of singing and music uh, addressed uh, needs uh, and kind of mood and energy uh, needs uh, and emotional needs of the patients as well as the physical needs. Now, here is the welcome pack that they received. It contained a welcome note from the ENO Breathe team and items including a mug, tea, and biscuits. Very English in approach. And here is a, a statement from one of the patients. ENO Breathe is so powerful because it responds to our illness humanely, openly, richly, and through emotions, embodiment, culture, art, ideas. Whereas medical spaces, even if we can access them, can be so alienating and emotionally and spiritually em empty, so averse to treating the whole person. ENO Breathe has been healing for the trauma I've experienced and continue ex to experience of having an unknown illness, not knowing if I will ever get better and of barely receiving barely any medical care for over a year. So this speaks to the integrative approach. So there is the breath training, uh, the singing training, approaching the breath training through singing training, but also addressing the um, emotions uh, and art, uh, which meets the other emotional and spiritual needs of the patient. Now, here's another approach. Uh, this is a stellate ganglion block, and you might say, well, this is invasive, but it's minimally invasive. Um, this was a only a two, two patients in this case series. It was done in the U.S. by some neurologists. And what this does is it dress, addresses the dysautonomia, the uh, abnormal autonomic nervous system that can result in some things like uh, the postural uh, orthostatic syndrome and so forth. Um, so the, in, this, uh, in this approach, the cervical autonomic chain activity, which you see right here, these nerves right here, are blocked by a local anesthetic. And this allows the regional autonomic nervous system to re reboot. This has been done for some other diseases. And so some people uh, have you know, thought of using it for this, um, for the dysautonomia um, uh, manifestations of long COVID. Haven't been any uh, you know, randomized or controlled studies on this yet. This is just a two patient case series. Okay, acupuncture. Um, the treatment rationale for acupuncture uh, follows that of, a, of the acute infection. 
And so that is for immune dysfunction, the approach of acupuncture would be to expel pathologic heat to clear lung damp dampness. Uh, the uh, medians Tai Yang and Yang Ming zones are used. Uh, and there's and in that approach, nourishing, nourishing and mobilizing Qi, which is the energy or life force. There uh, are other um, additional approaches that may be used depending on the patient's particular conditions. And the publications to date are cases and uh, the, the approach, the treatment rationale um, approach and considerations. There are no randomized studies on this yet or controlled studies, but uh, case reports and certainly the rationale uh, is there that it may be helpful. You know, so ID Week 2022, just a few months ago, uh, the NIH's statement is there's no specific treatment for long COVID yet. You and your healthcare provider can work together to create a personal care plan to manage your symptoms and improve your quality of life. So in that setting, you know, these, these things that I've just talked about, there has been some, some studies done and some rationale for of these uh, specific treatments. And yet there's also other things that we can do in terms of a general approach um, that have been talked about in the integrative medicine world. And so I'll talk to you about those as well. So a big approach in integrative me medicine is nutrition, using an anti-inflammatory diet, Dr. Weil's anti-inflammatory diet, uh, which can be found under drweil.com, and also the Mediterranean diet, which is, which is very similar. It's also anti-inflammatory. Um, basically, the Mediterranean diet uh, is the base of that pyramid is whole grains. And the next step up is fruits and vegetables with the anti-inflammatory diet. The base is fruits and vegetables. And the next step up is whole grains. So these are very similar. Uh, they emphasize a plant-based diet um, and, uh, you know, less uh, red meat, uh, less, uh, less inflammatory foods such as red meat and processed foods. Um, so these, both of these diets have a low glycemic index, low saturated fat, and uh, they modulate inflammation. Uh, they've been shown to improve lung function. So that's one of the rationales for uh, using them in this setting. Uh, there are plant-derived uh, flavonoids that decrease the activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome, so they can decrease inflammation. And uh, we know that severe infection is catabolic, and so it can lead to nutrition deficiencies, nutrient deficiencies, such as protein, B vitamins, vitamin C, copper, zinc, and iron. So uh, either eating a you know, well-balanced balanced diet that has these things in the food that you're eating or uh, using some supplements to make sure that you're not deficient in these things. Um, so foods rich in vitamins and minerals, and that would be uh, the vegetables, the dark green uh, leafy vegetables, uh, red and orange um, vegetables, legumes, and other vegetables, as well as fruits. And the general guideline on protein is uh, eating 0.8 to 1.5 grams per kilogram body weight daily, depending on your age and other conditions. Uh, supplements that may be used, uh, you know, vitamin D, uh, it's a good thing to check your vitamin D level because many of us are deficient these days. And um, there's also some uh, rationale in the sense that vitamin D can be anti-inflammatory as well as antiviral. Uh, glutathione may be used. It's, it's an antioxidant, can especially be helpful in the lung epithelium. And then glutathione generating compounds like selenium. Now, I will say that selenium supplementation, sometimes you, it's easy to get selenium toxic. So it's, it's I think, better to get selenium from natural foods. And Brazil nuts are an excellent source of selenium. If you eat one or two Brazil nuts a day, that's going to be a great source of selenium, a natural source. Um, other glutathione generating compounds, N-acetylcysteine or NAC, and ginger. Uh, melatonin is an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory and immunomodular, immunomodulatory. It can also be helpful uh, for sleep. Um, and because insomnia is one of the problems sometimes in long COVID. I will say that sometimes the, the uh, three milligram dose, which is about the lowest form that you'll find in the pill form, um, that may be too much for some people because they may wake up drowsy. If that does happen, you may wanna go to the liquid form of melatonin where you can take a smaller dose and even start with like uh, a half a milligram 
and work up to see what works for you. Okay, now other supplements uh, that can be used that are anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. Cordyceps sinensis is a medicinal mushroom. And uh, if you've watched uh, the series, uh, The Last of Us, Cordyceps is the bad actor in that that's, that's killing off everybody. But in real life, Cordyceps is a really good mushroom. It's a medicinal mushroom. Uh, it's an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and increases natural killer cells. It can improve exercise performance and decrease airway inflammation. So there's a rationale for using it, especially in people that are having uh, post-exertional malaise and shortness of breath. Astragalus is another supplement. Uh, it's, it's a root. Uh, another name for the plant is milk vetch. It's also an antioxidant. It can increase immunity and modulate inflammation. It's been shown uh, in cancer patients to decrease fatigue, pain, nausea, and also to improve sleep. And finally, garlic as a supplement. Um, uh, you may taste it on your breath, though. Uh, but it's been shown to downregulate inflammatory cytokine, cytokines and decrease cold and flu symptoms. So what about, you know, manual um, movements or, or uh, manual exercises that you can do with breathing and movements? Certainly breathing exercises like diaphragmatic breathing instead of our usual, you know, um, shallow breathing that we do, um, particularly if we're anxious, we tend to have rapid, shallow, irregular breathing only using our chest. And so if we think about using diaphragmatic breathing, and that's taking slow, deep, regular breaths, using abdominal breathing, you can put your hand on your abdomen, and you should feel your abdomen moving out when you take a breath in, because that means your diaphragm is moving down, uh, and expanding fully. So uh, that kind of uh, breathing is, is good for uh, expansion of the chest and for lung function. And that kind of breathing is also good for calming our bodies and from changing from the stress response to the relaxation response. So that's a good type of breathing to use in any case. Um, there's pursed lip breathing, which can help uh, with the shortness of breath. Pranayama, which is... Um, breathing exercises and yoga, and uh, really almost any form of yoga, if you're doing the breathing correctly, you're getting good yoga breathing exercises. And then there's some special uh, breathing exercises in this pranayama form of yoga that you can find uh, some of those online. Tai Chi is similar to yoga in terms of the breath work. Um, so that's another opportunity to do uh, your breathing exercises there. And then singing, like the English National Opera Approach, uh, using singing, if you're singing, you're um, using your diaphragm, you're taking deep breaths, um, and that can be good breathing exercise. Pulmonary rehab, we talked about the inspiratory muscle um, uh, exercises. Movement only is tolerated. Um, you know, don't really push yourself, especially if you're having post-exertional uh, fatigue, but movement only is tolerated because otherwise you can become overtired. And then uh, another uh, movement meditation, qi gong. Uh, qi is the natural life force or energy, and gong means a uh, practice that you've developed over time. Um, and this can improve lung function, especially if you use some of the qi gong routines that focus on the lungs. And this is one I found just going through YouTube, looking for qi gong exercises for lungs. This uh, helps with lung immunity. Um, and also in Chinese medicine, the lung is the organ that carries grief and sadness. So activating the lung channel can help both with your um, immune system and also with relieving those feelings. Uh, this is showing you the lung channel um, here, points lungs one and two and going on down uh, to the tip of the thumb here. So it goes on the inner aspect of the arm. And so uh, these this particular Qigong routine focuses on these uh, acupressure points. And you can find these again on YouTube if, if you uh, just search for Qigong exercises for lungs. Okay, and then other general principles for stress management, mindfulness. Uh, there's a lot of evidence now that using mindfulness, and uh, that means just being present in the moment without judgment, with curiosity. Um, if we're using our mindfulness, 
That can decrease our stress and cortisol, which decreases inflammation. Using meditation, guided imagery, yoga, tai chi, all of those can help us with mindfulness. And then incorporating deep breathing during those periods for mindfulness for the vagal parasympathetic response. Again, switching us from the stress response to the relaxation response. When we do that deep breathing, that stimulates the vagal nerve, which lets us know uh, that the bot lets the body know, you know, things are okay, you can relax. Also, creativity can help with stress management. Uh, expressive writing uh, has been shown to improve lung function, mental health, and uh, decrease pain. Aromatherapy. So in addition to that aromatherapy uh, proprietary blend that was studied, we can use aromatherapy uh, 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 oils that are shown to uh, cause stress relief, and that includes lavender, gera geranium, and others. There are also uh, aromas that can improve lung function, and that includes eucalyptus, primarily due to the 1,8-cineal component, and also peppermint, primarily due to the menthol component. Sleep. Sleep is very important. So, uh, you know, sleep hy hygiene um, with, uh, you know, avoiding uh, light stimulation from screens uh, for a few hours before bedtime. If you're going to be using your computer watching TV, you can use those uh, blue light glasses that block out the blue light that inhibits melatonin. Um, and then uh, you, you, know, you also want to sleep in a cool, dark environment, environment that also enhances healthy sleep. Um, and then you may want to use melatonin, as we talked about before, which can be helpful as a sleep supplement. And then the overall environment, uh, you know, using soothing sounds, green spaces uh, during the day, um, the whole concept of forest bathing or Shinrin Yoku from Japan, which has uh, shown that um, the evidence for just being out in green spaces and taking a mindful walk using all your senses in the green spaces, that can be a very relaxing and calming thing, decreases cortisol and so forth. Supportive social interactions. This is using your spirit to connect with others and find social support and then uh, cool, lower humidity. Uh, this is just to mention the RECOVER trial, which is an NIH multi-center trial um, that is researching COVID to enhance recovery. Right now, it is uh, still uh, enrolling some patients, um, but it's right now in the descriptive phase. And then uh, later on, once, once they enroll 6,000 or so people, um, there will likely be some interventional studies. Uh, this is our arm of the study here in San Antonio, Prevail, Prevention, Evaluation, and Incidence of Long-Term COVID in South Texas. And Dr. Thomas Patterson is the principal investigator. Uh, Barbara Taylor, uh, and you can see here others, uh, Jennifer Potter, uh, Brian Reeves, Suda, uh, Siddhar, Sashard, Sashardri, and Mark Goldberg are all uh, participating uh, PIs on this. And uh, you can see that this is being done at multiple other sites uh, in the country. So hopefully we'll have some information from uh, this study soon. And finally, I'll just end with this patient uh, who gave a TED talk. And she talked about when she ha had COVID, it was before the tests were well-developed and she tested negative, but uh, you know she had what sounded like classic COVID. And she said, you know, the doctors didn't listen to me. And multiple times when she went back really throughout her recovery, she felt like the doctors didn't listen to her. And so she, uh, one of her, um, you know, uh, takeaway points is make integrative medicine the norm. And by saying that, she means, you know, listen to the patient, believe the patient. And that uh, is a part of what we do in integrative medicine. Um, as far as addressing the whole patient, body, mind, and spirit. You can see her TED Talk uh, at the link there, and you can just, um, if you go to YouTube, you can just Google her name and listen to what she has to say. And I thank you for your attention. It came to a point to where my neck, which come to find out was my throat, 
was inflamed to the point to where I couldn't eat or drink anything. I felt like my throat was on fire. When I got contracted with COVID and then I went back in July with my PCP, he diagnosed me with psoriasis and he determined at that time that it was the long COVID. And at that moment, he gave me a steroid shot. And at that time, he just dismissed me after that. I didn't know what psoriasis was. It did affect my daily life because I wasn't too much informed of the symptoms. So as I went along, I kind of learned what it was on my own. Part of psoriasis is the shedding part. And a lot of the shedding was surprising to myself along with my family. Um, there was shedding every time I would sit on the sofa. Um, it got to the point to where my husband and I slept in different beds because the shedding was so much. I didn't have a lot of information from my doctor as far as treatment, so I would use Vaseline to help soothe my uh, soreness on my body. And I can go through a large container of Vaseline um, in two days, because I have to constantly be applying it so I can feel some relief. Some foods that I would love to eat, I can't eat anymore. I can't have any type of eggs, milk, um, salsa just burns my body. And I've learned it's hard, but I've learned to manage it because it's, I feel it, I feel the difference. Once I start eating salsa, I know that my skin is burning. So I've learned to change my diet and, and it's for my own good. I have a really great support system at my house. My sisters, my husband, and my daughters, they're really supportive. Um, as for my community, my church community, I reached out to my um, church friends and they were very supportive of it. First, I was embarrassed to come out and say anything, mostly because it was showing on my body. It was showing on my face, it was showing on my arms, and I was more embarrassed for them to see me and knowing that they were there supporting me made a big difference in my life. Um, when COVID hit me, COVID hit hard, even though I had been vaccinated and then I ended up with a psoriasis. And I think that maybe uh, if the doctors can pay a little bit more closer attention to long COVID uh, patients, and maybe um, not so much as maybe seeing them in, in their office, but just keeping some type of contact with them. That would have helped me a whole lot. Just letting me know how to better myself, um, how to make things more better to relieve my pain that I have. When I went to visit my dermatologist, he was the one that gave me a little bit more information as to the swelling, the inflammation that was causing the psoriasis was going to cause more um, symptoms on my body as far as um, it was going to start affecting my bones, my kidneys, my liver, uh, my eyesight. And the eye doctor also explained that that's part of the psoriasis as well because of the inflammation it's making my eyes um, have some type of um, inflammation as well. What's next for me is um, living my life. I was angry, very angry, because we have been taking care of ourselves, the whole family, the household, with uh, being vaccinated and being cautious and sanitizing and wearing our masks and we knew exactly how we had contracted it. And 
but it's here. There's nothing we can do about, about it. I, I did the best that I could to stay away from COVID. Now it's caused me the long-term psoriasis and I'll just take it one day at a time and keep my appointments and continue doing what's best for me. So this is now the third story that we've been able to share within this learning community. And uh, before we jump into the discussion, just a, a quick housekeeping. We're still having some technical issues with our, our hub team. They lost entire power to their building. So we're going to have a discussion about this case, and then we'll transition back to the end of Dr. Patterson's video um, in, in just a little bit. So um, I'm going to start with the same question that we started with in the last couple of videos, which is, let's start with what did you hear and what did you observe in this story? And then maybe we can also start to weave it in with some of the other two stories that we've heard so far. But who would like to start with us? What did you hear? What did you observe? Anybody willing to take the first stab? I will, Dr. Rosenfeld. Thank you. Hi, this is Cynthia De La Garza Parker. What I, our power kind of flickered off as well over here. So I caught the end of that video, but I did observe that the stigma that she faced, you know, maybe within her own community or, you know, keeping herself isolated from her friends because she felt maybe bad for herself because of this condition, her psoriasis. And then perhaps not welcomed even in her own bed because of all the flaking skin. Um, and so it's a plea for help. And then noticing that maybe her, her PCP did not follow up as much as she thought she should have, uh, keeping those lines of communication open. Um, perhaps a promotora could have helped in that instance or, um, you know, for follow up. Um, so there's a real need for all of that is what I what I heard and I observed. Yeah. Thank you, Cynthia. I appreciate that. Yeah, she mentions separating uh, where she sleeps with her husband and you've got to think she doesn't say it, but that has to have some sort of a socio emotional impact on on the two of them. Dr. Bergen, I see your hand. Well, she did mention that her her daughters, her sisters and her husband were all supportive that in, you know, she she was getting a lot of or is getting a lot of family support. And she talked about her faith community um, as being a source of support. And she also talked about figuring out from her own observations that certain things in her diet were making her worse. So dietary modifications, things that you can do to help yourself, and then leaning on social support um, to feel affirmed and give you courage. I heard all of those things. Yeah, thank you. Um, anybody else want to share? I see a couple things in the chat, which I'll just put out into the community. Um, Magdalena says having the guidance and follow up from the PCP and provided updated information regarding the D's was disease was a crucial factor, right? I think she talked about at the beginning, she didn't have that guidance and it wasn't until she went to a dermatologist that she got more insights into this. Um, other observations or reflections on this video and maybe how it relates to some of the themes that we've heard in some of the other stories so far? Um, I think that the desire for more communication with the healthcare yeah. provider, and, and she, she even said, um, it'd be nice if the doctor could stay in contact with us, even if we're not being seen in the office. And, you know, there are I think we're getting a little bit better in medicine about providing opportunities for electronic communications. Um, sometimes our protected electronic health records have a mechanism for patients to have a conversation with their physician. It may not be as real time as with your friend or your best buddy, but there are ways of doing that that can perhaps approach what people are craving, which is a little bit more um, feedback, a little bit more input in between the the in chunks of time between visits. Yeah, thank you, Ruth. Joaquin, I see your hand and then Rachel. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to say that like, I I love to see the, um, I love to see the strength in my community of color. This is like my strong mujer leadership kicking in. She is like, she had found the solution to what she needed to do, although she was enduring so many things and all the things that challenged her. She is 
a person who one not only was struggling with COVID just like the rest of us, but because she comes from a community of color, there were more things that were underlying that made it very more, more difficult. And what did she do? She made the, she built the strength up to endure. And so it's really good to see that, that, that we have that, we have the capacity to endure. Yeah, I appreciate that, Joaquin. And I think that's a theme we've heard from all the stories so far is that sense of, of uh, perseverance and determination to continue to push forward despite the challenges that this diagnosis and their conditions have created for them. Right, yeah, Dr. Pearson, Rachel. Yeah, I mean, hearing her, it sounds like the experience of her illness and then the complication, right, with the psoriasis was isolating. And she's asking for and finding connection and reconnection and like reintegration. Um, and so I absolutely agree. Like, yes, a promotora would be so helpful to help facilitate better communication with the healthcare team. And we as physicians can think more creatively about um, offline and community facing ways to interact with our patients, but also just to frame the need in that way to say, you know, this person here before me needs connection. How can I build connection to facilitate their healing? I think is helpful for me as a doctor to think about. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and Eddie's recognizing that this was a very similar um, story to his own travel uh, journey through long COVID um, in the chat saying that he moved into another bedroom to not disturb his wife and um, and then how she became the sole breadwinner. So it's putting all of these financial stressors, emotional stressors on us. And, and so my, my follow up question, and then we're going to probably have to wrap this up so we can return back to our didactic is, so how would this story and how have some of the stories we've heard so far, how how would these help or not help you engage with other individuals like these storytellers? We've already started to talk a little bit about that. Dr. Pearson was talking about that connectivity, connections, collectivity, um, hearing and seeing people. What are, what are some other thoughts that folks have? What can we learn from these to help us with others that we might engage with and have conversations with? Yeah, Eddie, I see you. Okay, uh, as a chaplain, I'm working with a company that has an excess of 200 employees, and I've been dealing with a number of folks that, that did go through COVID. Uh, some are still dealing with things, so it, uh, it's made me more empathetic, obviously, and we've been able to share some stories. So uh, I've had a couple of uh, grown men actually start crying, telling me that they finally feel like somebody is understands uh, what they've been going through. And, and uh, one gentleman, I mean, he's working, but his his back is all bent and everything else. So I've been able to share some of the things I learned from my physical therapist that uh, now he's walking a little bit more upright and stuff like that. So, you know, sometimes uh, you've got to go through the fire to understand how, how hot it really gets in there. So. Yeah, I appreciate that, Eddie. And, and we were talking as a team prior to this session about the need for creating social connections between individuals who are struggling with long COVID as well as their caretakers. And, and we'll, just a teaser, we want to create some sort of social group, a learning group that we're going to kind of help launch as a result of these conversations that we're having. So I appreciate you sharing that, Eddie. Thank you. Any other thoughts or reflections? Otherwise, I've got one more kind of comment that I'll throw to the wind to see what people react to, but lessons that we can learn. Yeah, please. Hi, I'm Ellie Grunder. I'm with uh, UT Health, the Texas CARES COVID antibody study. And um, one of the things that I noticed from this video was just, I. Uh, in my research, I have not come across as something like psoriasis being linked with long COVID. And so I think um, from a research perspective, like just not making assumptions um, based on the literature um, about what symptoms might be coming up. And then not only that, um, I think the, that this emphasizes the importance of qualitative research as well when trying to understand um, some of these symptoms that might not be expected to be linked to long COVID. 
Ellie, thank you so much for sharing that. And it's it, this is directly related to one of the points that I want to land on here to launch us into the second half of this ECHO series that Dr. Pearson and I were having a conversation the other day. And so this is for all of us, clinicians, public health professionals, researchers, CHWs. The question is, how can we remain in this space of uncertainty when we don't know whether or not the psoriasis was actually caused by long COVID or otherwise? live in this space, but yet still recognize people's lived experience, not dismiss it because, well, it doesn't fall into a category that we've either created or been told that the this is how we know whether or not you have this thing. So let's let's think about as we move forward, how do we stay in this space um, and then build those respectful relationships with each other and acknowledge people's lived experiences? Thank you. Thank you. I would like to say Thank uh, to Dr. Parson. I see that you are here with us, Dr. Parson. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, I'm here now. Thank you, thank you very much. And we have only a couple of minutes. I wonder if there is uh, something that we would like to ask Dr. Parson um, from the audience. We have a couple of minutes to close it, but thank you so much, very informative uh, presentation. With no questions, perhaps for this time, uh, I would like to, uh, Dr. Parsa, thank you so much for your kindness and, and prepare this recording. This is a very informative. I was uh, very amazed with all the information and all this uh, care that you offered in the, the presentation. I would like to also say uh, thanks to Dr. Bergen, to Dr. Rosenfield for our hub team, Dr. Barners, and for the ECHO team for this amazing work that it was done today. Thank you, you all, for being part of our session today. And please uh, go to the chat and, and complete the evaluation for, for credits that you may receive after you complete that. And I would like to remind you that we are not going to have a session next week, but we're going to regroup the following week, uh, March the 24th. Um, please uh, join us in our session. And until then, uh, you have a wonderful day.